بسم الله اوكي الحمد لله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا اللهم من وفق أهل الخير إلى الخير وفقنا إلى كل إلى كل الخير اللهم افتح علينا فتوح العارفين بك اللهم علمنا ما انفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزلنا عما وعملا صالحا As we covered last month we spoke about the life of Abu Hanifa رحمه الله تعالى and we said that chronologically he is the foremost of the four great imams and uh, we said that in the in the Fridays that we have uh, last Fridays or the fourth Fridays of the month until Ramadan then we'll cover the four imams inshallah we may have mentioned that this time of the four imams was a time of many great imams uh, I don't recall if I mentioned that or not but it is something that's very important to consider the the time of the four great imams was a time of many great imams. There were also other mujtahid imams on similar levels as the four imams who their bodies of work were not preserved for any number of reasons. But these ones are the ones that we still have in their entirety. So the second imam that we're going to speak about is Malik ibn Anas. Malik ibn Anas. And this is Imam Malik. Imam Malik was born, although there's some difference of opinion, but generally it's in the early 90s after Hijra. Most will say that it's 93 after Hijra. And we had said that Imam Abu Hanifa was born when after Hijra. Anyone remember or anyone know? Hmm. Imam Abu Hanifa was born 80 after Hijra. 80 after Hijra and Imam Malik is 93. So Abu Hanifa was 13 years before Malik. But Imam Abu Hanifa died in 150, whereas Malik died in 179. So he lived an extra 10 years, give or take, more than Abu Hanifa. So Malik was born and lived his entire life in Medina. And this is very, very important because his experience in Medina and his love for Medina uh, has a deep impact on his personality as well as his fiqh. It actually has an impact on his fiqh as well, although we're not going to spend much time on that or probably any time on that. Uh, the idea is essentially that hadith is passed from person to person or from usually a small group of people to a small group of people. And Imam Malik, what his position was, was that if the people, meaning the scholars of the people of Medina, act or do something in a particular way, that has more weight with him than a singular narration of hadith. Because he's in the couple generations after the Prophet wasallam. So he says if all of these scholars of Medina are doing something in a particular way, that's very strong to him. And he knows all of these people. So he's familiar with these the, the, the intellectual heritage of that city. He never rode in Medina. Imam Malik never rode in Medina. So what does this mean? The, 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 you know, the riding animals and stuff like this. Once he got to the area of Medina, he would get off. He wouldn't, out of respect for the area where the Prophet wasallam is buried. His mother and his father were actually Yemeni Arabs. They were Arabs of a Yemeni descent. There is some debate on it, but the stronger opinion is that they were both from Yemeni descent. His great-grandfather was a companion of the Prophet ﷺ. So his name was Abu Amir. Abu Amir. This matters because later on we'll see in one of the stories, if we get to it, they'll see, you'll see them refer to Malik as Ibn Abi Amr. So they're calling him the son of his great-grandfather um, as a reference to he's from this lineage that goes back to the companions of the Prophet uh, His uh,
grandfather or great grandfather was uh, known to the, the, his family was known to have a connection to the Sahaba. You know, one of them narrated from Omar Talha Aisha Abu Huraira. One of his family members was from the four people who carried Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu his grave when he was after his at, at his burial. So they're very tightly connected to the city of Medina and to the scholarly tradition of the city of Medina. And his family was a family of people of knowledge and particularly people who had knowledge in hadith. And Imam Malik, is, this is his big thing. His, his fiqh was very, was very strong in fiqh, but he was also very strong in hadith. And before Bukhari and Muslim, because this is much, much, much before Bukhari and Muslim, we're talking about 200 years, 150 years before Bukhari and Muslim, Imam Malik has his hadith collection. And his hadith collection is entirely authentic. There's some debate on I think it's four of the hadith in the collection. But overall, it's a very reliable text. And Imam Malik was very rigorous in the way that he would uh, record and deal with narrations. His own personal father was not known for knowledge, but his grandfather was, his uncles were, and even his own siblings were. So initially when Imam Malik was young, they used to refer to him as the brother of Nadr. Meaning his brother was someone of knowledge and his brother was someone who was well known so they would refer to him as the brother of this person. And later on, after Imam Malik learned more, they used to refer to his brother as the brother of Malik. So things changed with time. Uh, the general ambiance of where he lived was knowledge and learning. This is, uh, it cannot be overemphasized. I mean, Imam Malik is growing up in a community of people who can trace their connection to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I mean, imagine if we're sitting in a community and people can say, yeah, my grandfather, he was sitting with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this happened. So this is how close the connections were and this is how influenced he was by his environment. Uh, and he used to, of course, you know, it was known, the, the, the area of Medina was known as the cradle of the Sunnah. That if you want to learn the sunnah, this is where you go. You go to Medina because this is where these great imams were. After memorizing the Qur'an, he devoted himself to memorizing hadith, which was part of the tradition of the city he grew up in. And he used to go to the assemblies of the scholars. He used to write down what they taught. They would study it. And he told his mother that he wanted to go study. And when he told her this, she dressed him in his best clothes and she wrapped his turban very nicely and she told him to go to Rabi'ah to Rai. Rabi'ah, who is one of the scholars of the, the Medina, she told him, go to him. Uh, so she told him, go to him and learn from his character before you learn from his knowledge. This was very, you know, it's a very important point because the knowledge that we learn is meant to just be something that helps us uh, towards the embodiment of the actual message. And the scholars are referred to as the inheritors of the prophets, not because they just pass along the same information, but because their learning of the information is supposed to lead to its embodiment, which then puts them on the, on the, on the path of the prophets. And so when she tells him, go to him and learn and imagine she's telling him in this community in this time in this place go to him and learn from his adab before you learn from his knowledge so there must be an understanding that these people they hold themselves at a very high level and actually there's a story that comes later on about how he left Rabia and it was mentioned in a letter that Layth wrote to Malik uh, Layth as I mentioned last time I recall that Layth ibn Sa'ad was a great scholar of Egypt, uh, one of the great imams at that time as well. And him and Malik, they have actually a correspondence between each other. And it's published today. You can still find it in the stores. And Layth, he wrote to Malik, and he told him, you know, you had this disagreement with Rabia, and you left studying with him and so on. But then he comes, he says, and, and Layth basically says, and I agreed with you on this position that you took and how you disagreed with Rabia on that point. But then he comes at the end and he says, In spite of that, Allah be praised, 
Rabia is an excellent man and has a fine intellect, an eloquent tongue, clear virtue, an excellent path in Islam, and true love for his brothers. So this is the person that she's telling her son, go and learn his character. Because these qualities are very important qualities. Imam Malik was very dedicated. You know, uh, when he went, he saw, you know, he was young, he went to Rabia. One of them, one of the narrators, the contemporaries, they said, I saw Malik in the circle of Rabia when there was an earring in his ear. So the indication of this is that that was something that children used to have. So the idea is that Malik used to go to the study circle when he was really young. It wasn't, it wasn't before, you know, it wasn't like Abu Hanifa we talked about how he started studying later in life. But uh, Malik started much earlier in life. Uh, and he was eager to memorize everything that he possibly could. It says that when he was studying, he would move around to stay within the shade of a tree so that he could finish what he wanted to finish. So you imagine the community in Medina is very hot, right? And what he would do is he would go to a tree and he would sit in the shade of the tree. But as the time of the day progresses and he's memorizing and he's learning and he's reviewing what he wants to review, the shadow moves, right? So he would just move with the shadow. <laughs> move with the shadow, move with the shadow until he finishes what it is that he wants to finish. And his sister, she complained to their father. She said, this brother of mine, he doesn't go to visit people. <laughs> like basically she's complaining that her brother doesn't hang out, <laughs> right? And my brother, he doesn't hang out with people. He doesn't go spend time with them. He doesn't talk to anyone. He doesn't, like, it's not what he does. And the father, he told her, he said, my daughter, he is memorizing the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So she told him, leave him alone. What he's doing is a good thing. Let him do what he wants to do. Uh, he says, Malik, then one time, look at the strength of his aspiration. You see this in a lot of early peoples. Uh, their aspiration was very strong. So for example, he says, I had a brother who was the same age as Ibn Shihab. Ibn Shihab is Zuhri is older than Malik for probably a good amount of years. But he's older than Malik and he's saying, I had a brother who was the age of Ibn Shihab. And my father put to us a question and my brother was right in answering the question and I was wrong. So my father, he told me, have the pigeons distracted you from your quest for knowledge? <laughs> he said, like, what are you doing? Why are you playing around? Your brother knows the answer to the question. You don't know the answer to the question. So what did he do? Right, this is a difference. People, they knew what they wanted. They knew what they wanted. Sometimes we get too distracted. It's like I came to the masjid, someone didn't smile at me, and I wanted them to smile at me. So, which is not to justify that. People should be nice to each other. But someone did, didn't go the way I wanted it to go, so I stopped going to the masjid. You lost your visit to the house of Allah. Right? So Imam Malik, his father told him, why are you messing around? And you're not taking things seriously. So Malik said, I became angry and I devoted myself to Ibn Hurmuz for seven years. <laughs> so he says, I got upset about this. And I decided I'm going to this person, Ibn Hurmuz, and he studied with him for seven years. He went, put the time in, right? Stays with him for all that time. He says, I used to put dates in my sleeve and I used to give them to his children. And I would tell the children, if the people ask about your father, you say that he's busy. <laughs> so basically what he's doing he's going to the sheikh he's bribing bribing the sheikh's children so that other people don't distract him in his time with the sheikh right? he's trying to get there he's trying to learn and one day Ibn Hurmu said to his servant who is at the door and she went out she could only see Malik she came back she said it's only the ruddy skinned one you know it's just that guy that looks like this and Ibn Hurmu he said let him be that is the man of knowledge of his people so he recognized that there's a certain quality here to the person. Uh, I may have told you this story uh, about the sheikh and the student, that there was a sheikh who uh, a student wanted to study with him. So he went to the sheikh and he told him, I would like to study with you and so on. Sheikh said, sure, just come an hour before Fajr and bring the text. So the student is like, Alhamdulillah, you know, I get to spend time with the sheikh. Get the, he's gonna, I have to probably a private study session, I'm coming that early, you know. So he comes the next day, he knocks on the door. Sheikh comes out on the balcony, tells him, Iqra, read. <laughs> so he's down there on the floor outside the building and he's upside on the balcony, he tells him, go ahead, read from the book. He starts reading from the book, they have their class, right? 
shortly before Fajr time, he tells them, okay, kafa, you know, it's enough. Close the book, he comes down, they go to Fajr together. It's done for the day. Comes back the next day. They go through this for about a year. All right? Every day he comes, knocks, comes out on the balcony, he reads from the ground. Hmm? Then after a year passed, he told them, why don't you take a day off? Sheikh tells the student, why don't you take a day off? Oh, it's a big deal. After you've been going for this many days, you finally get a day off. He said, okay. He comes the next morning. Sheikh comes the next morning, an hour before Fajr, comes out on his balcony. He looks down. Who does he find? He finds the student. He didn't knock on the door because it's his day off, right? But he's just sitting there. Sheikh tells him, why did you, what are you doing? You know, I told you it's a day off. Why did you come and do this? And he said, Sheikh, I was afraid that if I gave my nafs a break for this one day, then it would want another day. <laughs> if I gave myself this break today, then tomorrow it's going to want another day off. So I was afraid that it would do that, so I decided I'm going to come today anyways. So the sheikh said, okay, closed the door, went back inside. <laughs> he came out afterwards for Fajr time, they went together. He told him, you're, you've officially, after you said what you said, you're not a student anymore. Now you're a teacher, right? But the idea is there's dedication. He went to him for seven years. Imam Malik went to him for seven years. And he recognized that this, he has something that's very um, special. Imam Malik, he didn't like to uh, argue and debate. You know, he didn't like to argue and debate. And he didn't like to argue and debate in front of general populations as well. So there's a story where one man, Imam Mu'tazili, came to him and he says, I asked him in the presence of the people a question about Qadr and he indicated that I should be silent. So they think it's not in here, but Imam Malik's gatherings were very disciplined. If people didn't follow the rules, the students would kick them out. <laughs> You're gone. If you don't speak out of line, you don't, he, they were very strict. So Imam Malik, he told him he should be quiet and uh, after the assembly was over, after the gathering was over, and people started, to, they were leaving, then he told the man, okay, come here and ask your question. He asked the question, and he started to give him the answer and refute it point by point. Like, this is the issue with what they said, this is the reason, this is, went into all of the details. The point was, he didn't want to have that conversation in front of the general population. He didn't want to put something in front of him that they're not familiar with, that might be a problem for them. This is what happens to us now. As a Muslim community, this happens to us all over the place. One of the biggest places you see it was college students. So college students come into the university. They have no formal education in Islam usually. They might have a few weekend school classes here, a few lectures there. They might like some people they listen to YouTube. But they're not actually studied in Islam. And then they come to the university and everyone's throwing things from different directions. And they read these academic texts and the academic texts are pulling stuff from all these different places and then they don't know how to make sense of it, right? Because they weren't actually ready to have that conversation. So he didn't like to do that in front of people unless they were able to handle that. Again, he was very uh, dedicated. One of the people that he studied with was Nafi'. Nafi'a was the Mawla of Ibn Umar. He was the servant, freed slave of Ibn Umar radiallahu anhumah. And so he had the knowledge of Ibn Umar and Umar radiallahu an. So Imam Nafi' he was, he, at the end of the narration, Manik says, he was prone to be a little bit irritable. <laughs> he wasn't always well-tempered. You know, he, was, he had knowledge from Umar and Ibn Umar, but he didn't always, you know, sometimes he would get uh, irritable. So he says, Manik says what he used to do. He says, I used to come to Nafi' for half the day. As long as the tree shaded me from the sun, I would wait for him to come out. So he would go and he would sit in the shade of the tree, wait till the man comes from his home. The imam comes from his home. Then he would say, he would turn to him and he would greet him. And then he would leave again. And they would kind of like walk parallel paths. And then he would bump into him again and ask him questions. I said, what did Ibn Omar say about such and such? Or what did Omar say about such and such? And he would get the one answer and then he would go on his way. So he was, he's saying, I would spend half the day. I'm just sitting, waiting for Nafi' to leave his house. When he leaves his house, I jump in, I get this little answer to the question, and I jump out because I know that he's irritable. And this is the way I get knowledge from him. SubhanAllah. I remember one time I was complaining. Was a, you know, I was someone who had very little adab. I continued to be from that category. 
Allah preserve us and forgive us. And I was complaining that one sheikh, he doesn't like sit with us and talk to us and stuff like that. He doesn't. It's funny, man. When you're in the da'wah mentality, you think that everyone's supposed to come to you. <laughs> but when you're in the knowledge mentality, you realize that you're supposed to go to people. <laughs> right? So I was complaining that the sheikh doesn't teach us and stuff like that. The brother was like, look, you know how you get knowledge from him? You go to Fajr, go up to him after Fajr, ask him whatever the issue is that you're interested in, and he'll talk to you. You'll get 30 minutes, 45 minutes, whatever. But you have to open the conversation. Don't think he's just going like, to come to you and start telling you things. So Imam Malik knew, this is how I get knowledge from him. I go to him in this particular way and I get it. He also wanted to get knowledge from Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri, who we mentioned. Zuhri was one of the earliest scholars to write hadith, like in a formal compilation. And they wrote hadith, but not in the way that he did. He kind of began that process. Um, and so he went to Zuhri, uh, or Zuhri visited them. Zuhri visited us, so we went to see him. Rabi'ah was with us, so his teacher is with them. He said, look for a book so I may give you the hadith from that. Do you think that you have retained any of the hadith that I gave you yesterday? They went one day, they got hadith, they went back the next day. He said, do you think you've retained anything from the day before? Rabi'ah said to him, here's someone who can repeat all the hadith that you gave us yesterday. And he points to Malik. Malik is the one who can give you everything that you taught us yesterday. He said, who is it? He said, Ibn Abi Amr, the one that we said before. You know, he refers to his grandfather, who was a great grandfather, who was Sahabi. He said, go ahead. Then Imam Malik repeated all the hadith that they got from Zuhri the day before. Zuhri said to him, I didn't think that there was anyone capable of memorizing this way except for me. <laughs> so I thought I was the only one that can memorize this. But Malik can also do this. Malik was uh, so dedicated that he would try to find the shayukh on their days off. So he says that I was, on the, I was at the Eid prayer and I said, this is the day on which Ibn Shihab retires. Like he's going to be at home and nobody's going to be bothering him at home. So I left the place of the prayer and I went and I sat at his door. And I heard him say to his servant, look and see who was at the door. She looked and I heard her say, it is your ruddy-skinned friend, Malik. Like, it's your buddy Malik, he's here. He said, bring him in. So I went in. He remarked, I did not see you going to your home after the prayer. I said, no. Have you eaten anything? No, I replied. He said, eat. He said, I have no need for that. He said, then what do you want? He said, I came here to get the hadith from you. It's in the day of Eid, right? Eid prayer happens. He goes to him afterwards. He didn't go home. He didn't go to eat. He didn't, I didn't come for any of that. I came for the hadith. He said, okay, come. So he brought his slates and he gave him a bunch of hadith and he said, I want more. He said, that's enough for you. If you can relate these, then you're a hafiz. You know, you know these hadith. He says, I memorized them already. So <laughs> you, know, you just gave them to me. He says, I memorized them already. He says, okay. He takes the slates from his hand. He said, all right, then tell me what they are. If you took them already, then tell me what they are. He's like, so I did them one, one after the next. I did this one, then I did this one, then I did this one. He narrated all of them back to Ibn Shihab. And Ibn Shihab told him, get up, you're a vessel of knowledge. You're, you are, you're, just go. <laughs> I already gave it to you. You already memorized it. You're done, basically. So he was very close with him. What he used to do is that when he would sit with Ibn Shihab, he would keep a string, a rope with him. And every time Ibn Shihab narrated a hadith to him, he would tie a knot in the rope. And his reasoning for this was such that he can know how many hadith were narrated. Right? He doesn't actually need to write them down. He can just pull the, do the knots, and then he knows how many he needs, and he can just recall them after that. Hmm. He was very strict about the way that he took hadith. Like one time... Uh, Malik was asked whether he had listened to Amr ibn Dinar. And he said, I saw him giving hadith and the people were standing up. I did not like to write the hadith of the Prophet wasallam while I'm standing. So he didn't have any way. You know, everyone's standing. He doesn't want to do that in order to get the hadith. So what are the three lessons? One of the lessons is that at the time, knowledge was taken directly from the mouths of the people of knowledge. And this is why memory was so important for the students. They want to get it directly from the mouth of the person who got it directly from the person before them who usually at that point you're to the Prophet The second thing is that in that period they had already begun writing the hadith which we know from Ibn Shihab. And the third is that Imam Malik 
put tireless amounts of effort into attaining this knowledge. Attaining this knowledge. So he put a lot of effort into it. They say that there's four types of knowledge that he put particular emphasis on. The first was that he tried, he, he learned how to refute different heretical groups. So this group says this, and this group says that, and what's the answer to them, and what is the position of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, and so on and so forth. The second thing is that he learned the fatawa of the companions and the tabi'een and the tabi'een. Tabi this was very important. All of the madhahib are actually based out of the fatawa of the sahaba and the tabi'een. There's a handful of issues that were new to them, but for the most part, they were relying on the scholars who came before them from the sahaba and the tabi'een. So actually, his muwatta is not entirely a book of hadith. There's a lot of the book that's opinions of sahaba. So he'll narrate the hadith, he'll narrate what the sahabi said, he'll narrate what the tabi'i said, sometimes he'll narrate his own opinion as well. The third is that he learned fiqh. So he learned the ability to interpret and, and derive rulings. And the fourth is that he learned hadith. Obviously, as we said, he was very uh, strong in hadith. He used to take the sitting to teach very seriously. And uh, like I said, his students were not allowed to be anything other than of the highest levels of adab while they take from him. Uh, and he used to not sit unless he could. So for example, um, he clarified why it is that he's teaching. He was teaching in the masjid, he clarified why it is that he's teaching. He said, no one who desires to sit in the masjid to teach hadith and fatwa can do so until they have consulted people of soundness and excellence about the people in charge and the people in charge of the masjid. Once they, only then, uh, and they consider them worthy, that, uh, only when they consider him worthy, they may sit there. So he's saying that if he wants to sit and teach, there has to be some recognition that he's capable of teaching. All right. SubhanAllah. I'll tell you an interesting story about this in a second. Then he said, I did not sit here until 70 of the people of knowledge had testified that I was ready to do so. He says, I didn't sit in this position in the masjid until 70 of the people of knowledge testified that I am able to do so. Uh, sometimes people don't understand this, you know. Like when I was in the masjid one time, for example, there was a man who came, came from out of town. He asked if he can give a khatira. And I basically said no. <laughs> and uh, it didn't, I tried to do it as nicely as possible, but I was basically saying like, I don't know who you are. He's like, well, I studied with this and this, and this one knows me and that one knows me. I'm like, okay, give me his phone number, I'll call him. If he's your sheikh, I'll call him. And I'll ask him who you are. If you're in, because the person he referenced was someone who's well known in uh, the Virginia area, older Imam. So I told him, I was like, great, give me his number, I'll call him, and it's fine. He's like, no, I'll call him now. So he like tries to call him while, you know, that's first. I'm like, I don't know. Just give me his number, I'll call him. You don't need to call him for me. <laughs> I'm trying to look you up. So we don't get through to the Imam. Then what happens is that he shows up at Fajr. And I'm not there at Fajr. And uh, he's made some relationships with people, whatever. And so he says, you know, can I give a khatir after Fajr? So someone lets, gives him the microphone, they let him give the khatir. Whatever, he didn't say anything that was outrageous. It was perfectly fine. But then what did he do afterwards? When he was trying to build relationships with the other masajid to try to let them give, let him give lectures and talks and stuff like that, he was telling them, and I already spoke at ICOI. See what happened? <laughs> this is why you don't let random people take the microphone. Because then you don't know what they're using it for. Like they, I got contacted. People contact me. They're like, so-and-so wants to give a lecture at the masjid. He says he spoke at ICOI. Is that true? Why you, like, what's the situation? Do you know him? So, I, don't, I have no idea who this person is. Then there were other shady things that happened. Allah protect us. But that's neither here nor there. Point is... He's saying you don't speak until people allow you to speak. People who have the position to do it. One time he was with his student, Abdurrahman ibn Qasim. And a man came to Malik and he asked him a question. 
And Ibn Qasim, he answered the question. Okay, so the question was asked to Malik and Ibn Qasim answered the question. Imam Malik turned to him angry and he told him, you dare to give fatwa, Abdul Rahman? I didn't give fatwa until I had asked myself whether I was ready to do so. When his anger went away, uh, when I had asked myself whether I was ready to do so, doesn't mean he was asking himself. <laughs> it means he was asking people about himself. Right? The translation's a little bit funny. So he says, until I, I, I asked people about it. And when his anger went away, they said, who did you ask? He said, I asked a Zuhri and Rabia. So basically what he's saying, I went to the biggest scholars of my time and I asked them before I opened my mouth. And you're sitting here with me and you're giving the answer. Right? So this is not the way that things should be. So Malik was very strict about these things. And uh, he used to sit actually in the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's quite beautiful. It says he used to sit in the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the, spa in the seat where Umar ibn Khattab used to sit for shura and, and hukum. So where Umar used to sit in the masjid, this is where Malik used to sit. And he actually also used to live in the house of Abdullah bin Mas'ud. So this is the tightness of the city of Medina, right? So he's living in the home that used to be the home of Ibn Mas'ud. And when he goes into the masjid to teach and give opinions and so on, he's sitting in the position of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhumah. Imam Malik didn't stay teaching in the masjid his whole life. Eventually his circle moved to his home. But that was because he was too ill uh, to do otherwise. However, it's interesting that even when he was too ill to do otherwise and he moved to his home, it says that he didn't cease studying, speaking, teaching, and giving fatwa. Uh, so he continued his uh, contribution to the community. He continued his teaching of others. It's reported that Malik used to come to the masjid and attend the prayers, Juma, and funerals. He used to visit the sick and he used to sit in the masjid. But then after that, he ceased to sit in the masjid and he wouldn't attend the, all of the things and they would come to his home and they would learn from him in his home. So that shifted over time. He had kind of a neutral relationship with most of the rulers of his time. He didn't necessarily openly advocate for revolution, but he didn't usually agree with the rulers themselves. He kind of took a position that he'll give advice to the rulers and so on, but that having uh, revolutions can cause great, great harm. And so he, he generally stayed away from that. Um, and if it happened, it happened, but he wasn't the one to encourage it. He did have a particular problem with one of the rulers who uh, punished him very severely. He said that he was whipped and he was also uh, racked. You know, like when your arms are pulled until his shoulders were dislocated. And the reason why the ruler said that was or, or did that was essentially because Malik um, <coughs> had given an opinion related to an act <coughs> that occurs under compulsion. And he said that this person who does this under compulsion, it's not valid. And that was the same position that the people who rebelled against the Khalifa were using to justify their rebellion. So they were saying that our allegiance to the Khalifa was, compul it was forced upon us and therefore it's invalid. So they were using the position that Imam Malik was using in divorce and applying it to the revolution and so Imam Malik was uh, punished for that because he didn't, he didn't not give the opinion. When people came to him and they asked him about this, he gave the opinion and so he faced the consequences. He used to like to wear nice clothes. Earlier in his life he didn't have much money. He was very poor. But later on he acquired more wealth and so he used to like nice clothes. He says, I do not like a man whom Allah has blessed not to show the effect of the blessing on him, especially the people of knowledge. And he used to say, I like it when a Quran reciter wears white garments. Uh, his food was not the cheapest of food, but he didn't overdo it either. He was said that he actually really enjoyed eating meat and meat was relatively cheap in Medina at that time. It was accessible to people and so he used to eat a certain amount of meat actually every day and from fruits and stuff like that his favorite of the fruits was the banana and he used to say that banana is there's nothing closer to the fruit of paradise than the banana so he used to really enjoy it and eat it uh, he used to get garments from all kinds of places 
and he would like to dress again in a nice way. He didn't like friv frivolity or, 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 or playing around when it came to knowledge. And they said something very interesting. His, one of his students, they said, when Malik was with us, it was as if he were one of us. He was cheerful with us in conversation, and we had the greatest humility towards him. When he began the hadith, his words filled us with awe. It was as if he did not recognize us, and we did not recognize him. So this is very interesting. They're saying that when in everyday life, he would be very humble with them and it would be, you know, whatever it is. But when he starts teaching hadith, this is the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it has a certain decorum, it has a certain respect, it has a certain adab that comes along with it. He said the people of knowledge should dispense with joking, particularly if they have some renown in knowledge. You know, maybe they're early in the path, they can do whatever they want to do. But once they get to a point where they're respected as being a high-level scholar and so on, then they have to carry themselves in a certain way. Again, he was very strict with his things. It's said that when people would come to his home and the servant would go to them and she would ask them, this was the instruction that Malik had given her, when they come to the home, the servant would ask them, do you want fatwa or do you want hadith? If they said we want fatwa, he would come out, he would ask them, they would answer, they would give the question, he would give the answer, if he had it, and it was done. If they told him we want hadith, then he would go back, he would make ghusl, and he would put nice clothes on, and he would fix his turban, and he would, he would put itar on to make sure that he smells nice, and then he would burn oud, bukhur, in the entire narration of the hadith. As long as he's narrating hadith, he would burn the bukhur so that it smells nice, and he's in a certain position in Hay'a, and then he would teach the hadith in that way. One of the people, they said, I never uh, had awe of anyone other than the ruler of Andalusia until I saw Malik in Hajj. And when I saw Malik, I was just completely in awe of like his, the way that he carried himself uh, and the way that he dealt with people. And he had a very deep fear to answer questions. And Malik had a very deep fear to answer questions, and he was Imam Malik. Uh, he would begin his answer by saying, "Ma sha Allah la quwwata illa billah," and then he would often say, "La adri, I don't know." Uh, this is simply, or he would say, "This is simply our opinion, and I'm not so sure about it." One time, they said a man asked Malik about a question, and he mentioned that he had been sent for that purpose on a six-month journey from Morocco. Man came six month journey from Morocco to come see Malik in Medina to ask him the question. Malik told him, tell the one who sent you that I have no knowledge of it. They said, who knows it? So Malik said, whoever Allah has taught about it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have knowledge on this issue. I'm not forced by your circumstance to say something that I don't know. Right? Another man who came from the Maghrib, Morocco area, he said, I don't know. We have not been tested with this matter in our land and I have not heard any of our sheikhs speak about it. So you can go back. The next day the man came, his baggage was filled, he was ready to go. He said, my question, man, he said, I don't know. The man said, Abu Abdullah, I've left behind people who saying there's no one on the face of the earth that's more knowledgeable than you. Malik replied and he said, when you return, tell them that I don't think that that's true. <laughs> you know, what am I supposed to tell you? I don't have the answer. And the second thing is that he didn't like actually uh, his students to write down his fatwas because he would say I don't know maybe my opinion is going to change with time maybe I'll learn more maybe I'll be exposed to more things and I don't want you to write it down sometimes there were things that were very clear and they would write but generally he didn't like for them to do that uh, and and you know he was very very a lot of wara a lot of scrupulousness about answering questions about giving answers um, and he just didn't like to do it, you know, and it's amazing. <laughs> that, that point always just amazes me because most of us are so excited to share anything that we can about anything that we shouldn't be sharing on any time that we can. And these, they were the people who were supposed to be, I mean, he's Imam Malik. He's saying, I don't know. Subhanallah. The thing is, sometimes we think like, we think, oh, we don't know the answer. The world is going to collapse or something. The world is not going to collapse because people are working out an answer. Most of the things that we need to know, we already know. 
most of the things that we need to know on a daily basis, we already know. It's going to be okay if an answer needs to be worked through, people need to think about it, and so on. Uh, I already said what he said about Mansoor and about the other. Uh, he used to advise the caliphs. One of his students said to him, people keep saying that you visit the rulers. So there was this big thing in Muslim history about scholars going to rulers. Many of them would stay away. They would never go upon any ruler. They would never speak to them. They, because they're... In, in, um, not Jonathan Brown. What's the guy's name? Noah Feldman. Noah Feldman's a researcher in Islamic history and law and so on. I think he's at Harvard. And he wrote this interesting book called The, the, the Fall and Rise of the Islamic State. And one of the things that he says in there is that in Western, especially American democracy, you have three, three part balance of power, right? You're supposed to have the executive, the president, and you have the legislative, which is Congress and you know, the House and the Senate, and then you have the judicial, right? And these three branches of government are supposed to balance each other. And he says in the traditional Muslim societies, it was two branches. It was the rulers and it was the scholars. And the scholars were the check on the rulers. They were the ones who could check the power of the rulers. Those are the only ones. And so, you know, Imam, there's a big debate. Do you go to scholars? Do you go to the rulers or not? He says, Imam Malik said to him, his student comes to him, he says, people say you visit the rulers. Malik said, that is a burden on myself. I do it because otherwise he might consult those whom he should not consult. So he's basically saying, this is not something I like to do. This is something I do because if I don't go and give advice to the ruler, they're going to take it from somewhere else. So at least if I have the ability to be strong and go to him and say the truth, then I should go say the truth. Uh, and he used to demand that they respect him. So when the Khalif uh, al-Mahdi came to Medina and people came to give him bay'ah, you know, he was the new Khalifa, came to Medina, people went to give him bay'ah, and uh, Malik asked for permission to enter to come into this gathering and the people said today Malik will sit at the far end of the gathering you know they're kind of like Malik today he's going to sit at the back because now you have this big ruler here and Malik came into the gathering and he, he looked around and then he turned to the Khalifa and he told the Khalifa where is the Sheikh going to sit <laughs> the Khalifa said he sit next to me <laughs> he came he sat at the front of the gathering now, Imam Malik was this way. He would go to the front of the gathering. He wouldn't. And I've told stories before about him. Like when one of the Khalifas, he sent him a letter. He said, I want my, my children to study with you. So why don't you come to Iraq so that they can study with you? Malik told him, sent him a letter back. He said, knowledge doesn't go. It's come to. If you want your children to study with me, you send them to me. I'm not, I'm not coming to you. Now, he was very, that he's, I'm the inheritor of the Prophet wasallam. You are not, basically, is his point. So you deal with it however you want. And this is not arrogance. It's la you know, It's not out of arrogance. It's out of respecting and giving dignity and honor to the message of the Prophet So he used to go to them. He used to give them big advices. Uh, he used to go to them, tell them, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an said, By Allah, if a lamb died on the bank of the Euphrates, I would think that Allah Almighty would ask Umar about it. He went on Hajj for 10 years and I'm told that he spent 12 dinars on his Hajj. You know, he's, he's just telling them all of these things about Omar. But this is the way that he was, this is the way that you should be if you're going to rule the Muslims. So he took this stuff very seriously. Sufyan ibn Uyayna, who was one of the great scholars of that time as well, as I mentioned, he was also in the category of the Imams of that time. He said, may Allah have mercy on Malik. He was exceedingly careful in the way he selected narrators. You know, in his narrators of hadith, he was very careful. And then it's also said, we used to, he, Sufyan said, we used to follow in Malik's footsteps. When Malik used a sheikh as a source, we would also do so. He only conveyed sound hadith from reliable people. I think that Medina will disintegrate after Malik goes. I think Medina will disintegrate after Malik goes. We don't realize the importance of people in our midst. So for example, when Dr. Saqr dies, Allah yurhamu, there's consequences to that. We may not see them, we might not realize them, but someone who was pious, 
that Allah brings blessings to a place because of the piety of the people in that place. When you lose a great pious person, you lose a lot. So Sufyan is saying when Malik goes, Medina is going to disintegrate. Right? It's, it's not about... Uh, there's a lot that's lost when great people die. It's the opposite of the verse that we read earlier. You know, the verse we read earlier was about people who disbelieve and they cause corruption and so on. So, ma beket is You know, like when they passed, the the sky didn't weep and the earth didn't weep when these people passed. But when the great people pass, the entire earth feels it. You know, like uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said about who was it? I think Sa'd ibn Mu'adh. Or that when he, pa- when he died, then the throne of Allah shook. You know, like this was a big deal when this companion of the Prophet them passed away. Shafi'i said, when a tradition comes to you from Malik, hold on to it tightly. When a tradition comes to you from him, know that Malik is the star. When scholars are mentioned, know that Malik is the star. No one reached the level that Malik did in his knowledge through his memory, his proficiency, and his scrupulousness. Whoever wants a sound hadith must have Malik. Ahmed said, so you see the other imams. Ahmed ibn Hanbal said, Malik is the master of the masters of knowledge, and he is their imam in hadith and in fiqh. Very uh, strong. He used to say, no one makes do with little in this world without Allah making him speak with wisdom. And he said to his student, Ibn Wahab, if you desire to gain what is with Allah by your quest, then you have obtained what will benefit you. If you desire to gain this world by your learning, your hands will remain empty. It's very, very important. You know, especially I would tell the younger brothers, it's very, very important. Because... When you, it's, it's, you know, when someone is kind of like older and they decide this is the way that I was living, this is the way that I want to live and I want to go study, there's a very clear break. And there's a very clear intention as to what they're trying to do. But when you're raised in an environment where you study, it can just become habit, right? Like we memorize the Qur'an and then we memorize the hadith, and then we study this book, and then we study that book, and then we get older, and that's just like what we do. But that's good, alhamdulillah, that's good. But Ibn Wahhab, Imam Malik is telling him, if you desire to gain what is with Allah by your quest, then you will have obtained what will benefit you. This is very, very important. Like when we go down the path of seeking knowledge, when we go down the path of trying to learn more about Islam, that there's etiquettes to it, there's ways of being to it, so on and so forth, and that we should, you know, take these things seriously. One time Imam Malik was speaking to his student, Ibn Qasim. He said, I have been reflecting on one question for some 20 years, and even now I don't have an opinion on it. <laughs> so this student, Ibn Qasim, I've been thinking about this issue for 20 years. I haven't figured it out yet. Ibn Abd al-Hakim, he said, when Malik was asked about a question, he told the questioner, go away so that I can look into it. Okay, he said, go, give me some time to think about it. The man went away and he came back several times. And we spoke to Malik about it. Like, the guy keeps coming back, you're not giving him an answer. He said, he wept. Imam Malik started crying and he said, I fear that I will be asked such questions on a day. And what a day. You know. When I come in front of Allah, I'm going to be asked about these things. So I'm worried about that. I don't want to give these answers. One time someone came to Malik, and they told him, it's just a simple question that I have for you. Imam Malik got angry. He told him, a light, simple question? There is nothing light in knowledge. Have you not heard the words of Allah? سَنُنْقِي عَلَيْكَ قَوْلًا ثَقِيلًا We're going to put a weighty word on you. Hey, when we're talking about... He says, all knowledge is weighty, especially what we will be asked about on the day of rising. So he's saying, this is not... He used to say about this, nothing is harder for me than when I am asked a question about the halal and the haram, because this is absolute in the judgment of Allah. I met the people of knowledge and fiqh in our land, and if one of them was asked such a question, it was as if death were dearer to him. But I see the people of this time desiring to discuss it and give fatwa. If they had understood what it is that they are heading for tomorrow, they would have done little of this. 
As for Umar ibn Khattab, Ali and Al-Qamah, the best of the companions and the best generation to whom the Prophet ﷺ was sent, when questions came to them, they would gather together the companions and they would ask. Then and only then would they give their opinion on it. The people of our time now pride themselves in their fatwas and the knowledge they have. It was not the way of the people nor of those who passed away before us who are followed and on whom Islam is based to say, this is halal and this is haram. They would say, I dislike this and I think this, but as for the halal and the haram, that is inventing things against Allah. I have heard the words of Allah say, tell me, what do you think about the things Allah has sent down to you as provision and which you have then designated as lawful and unlawful? Because the halal is what Allah and his messenger have made halal and the haram is what they have made haram. So he was very serious about this. He would often say, I don't know. He would say, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And this was out of his fear for Allah. He also would not argue on issues of ilm. And his position was that uh, doing so, he said, quarreling and argument in matters of knowledge remove the light of belief from the heart. He said, this is not... There's nothing to argue about here. No. This is one position, this is its evidence. This is the other position, this is its evidence. If you want to talk about it in a calm way, we can talk about it. If you don't want to talk about it, assalamu alaikum. We don't need to do that. Right? It's not, it's not going to benefit anyone. And look what he's saying, it's very important because there's a spiritual connection in the knowledge. He says that quarreling and argument in matters of knowledge removes the light of belief from the heart. So you sit there and you argue about it and you debate about it and so on and so on. It becomes very dry. Whereas it's supposed to be the means by to coming closer to Allah. So the light that's associated with that knowledge when it's treated in that way, it disappears. One time someone, uh, Zuhri said, I saw Malik when some people were arguing in his presence. He got up and he changed his cloak. He said, you people are at war. He left them. Didn't want to be around them. Uh, he said, should a man of knowledge of sunnah argue about it? He said, no. He should inform people about the sunnah if they will accept it from him. Otherwise, he should remain silent. Just remain silent and don't deal with it. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. This was Imam Malik, rahimahullah ta'ala. And he was a great, great man. And he was the inheritor of the scholarship of Medina. And Medina had great people in it. Uh, that Ibn Mas'ud, Zayd ibn Thabit, Ibn Umar, Abdullah ibn Abbas, all these people were in the area of Medina. Preceding Imam Malik, there were the seven fuqaha of Medina. I'll just say their names because you might hear their names. Then you know these are the seven, they're called the fuqaha seba. And the seven fuqaha of Medina before Malik was Sa'id ibn Nusayb, Urwa ibn Zubair, Abu Bakr ibn Abdurrahman, and Qasim ibn Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, the grandson of Abu Bakr, Ubaidullah ibn Abdullah ibn Utbah ibn Mas'ud, Sulaiman ibn Yasar, and Kharija ibn Zayd ibn Thabit. That all of these were the seven fuqaha of Medina. And so Imam Malik came into this uh, area. So this is just a glimpse of his knowledge. The book, The Four Imams, is a very important book. Uh, it's a good translation that the, the sister did, Aisha Buli. Um, what he does in the book, the author Abu Zahra, rahimahullah, is that he brings, the first half is on the life of the imam, and the second half is on the methodology of the imam. We've left out the methodology because it's not as directly applicable for people who are not students of fiqh. But for the life, we can benefit a lot from their lives. The original of these... Each one was its own book. So she really condensed it in order to make this in English. But each one in Arabic is its own book. There's actually eight of them. There's one on each of the four Imams, and then there's one on Ja'far al-Sadiq, and Zayd, Imam Zayd, and Ibn Taymiyyah, and Ibn Hazm. So Abu Zahra was a great Egyptian scholar of recent times. Uh, they said about Abu Zahra that his memory was so strong that he would come into PhD thesis dissertation debates, you know, munaqasha, what is it called in English? The defense of the dissertation. And he would just sit down and he would ask the student, you know, 
on page so and so you wrote this on this line why did you do that what's your reasoning on page so and so you said this on page so and so you just quote he just read it once and then come without the paper and quote from the uh, from the dissertation and one time one man who's a great scholar he passed away and he left an inheritance it's in modern Egypt Abu Zahra died I think in the 70s if I'm not mistaken it's very recent um, Rahimahullah Ta'ala and a man, the family of the man they came to like none of us are in scholarship and he has this huge library we want to give it to you and so Sheikh Abu Zahra told them just give me a few days in the library and then we can talk about it so he went into the library he came out a few days later and they, he gave them the keys back and he's like I'm done so they got offended they said, we wanted to give this to you as all this stuff. And now you're saying you're done. You were just in there for a couple of days. He's like, Alhamdulillah, I got everything that I needed from the library. <laughs> like, I, I went in, I read the things that I hadn't read before. I memorized them. I left. I'm done with the library now. <laughs> and they thought he was joking. He's like, go ahead, ask me. I can't tell you the stuff that, that I read. So, Sheikh Abu Zahra was a great scholar. Rahimahullah uh, ta'ala. So it's a good book, the four imams. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to benefit from these great people that have come before us and help us to follow their ways. And may he make anything that we learn from them a sadaqa jariya that continues to benefit them in their grave and in their hereafter up until now, inshaAllah. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasimah kathira. Subhanakum wa bihamdik nishadu wa la ilaha ila astaghfirukun wa tubi ilaik. Wa la asri illa al-insana da fi khusri illa al-lazina amanu wa amanu salihayat wa tawasu bin haqqi wa tawasu bin sahbihi. Any questions or comments, maybe just one or two, so we can have the adhan and get ready for salah, inshallah, if anyone has anything. Taib alhamdulillah. Jazakum khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.